Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on the conservation laws and in this lecture we will look at the Indian Forest Act continuing our discussion in the last lecture. So, chapter 9 of the Indian Forest Act 1927 talks about the penalties and procedures. Now, when we say penalties and procedures, you can find that penalties means there are substantive provisions and procedure means that there are procedural uh, provisions. So, this act has both substantive as well as procedural parts. Section 52 says seizure of property liable to confiscation. So, if there is a property that can be confiscated, what do we mean by confiscation? It means that that particular property becomes a government property. And before making something a government property, it has to be seized. So, it will be seized by the officer and it will later be made into a government property. So, when there is reason to believe that a forest offence has been committed in respect of any forest produce, such produce together with all tools, boats, carts or cattle used in committing any such offence may be seized by any forest officer or police officer. So, we will notice here that in a large number of sections powers have been given both to the forest officers as well as to the police officers. And whenever a forest offence has been committed, then not only that forest produce, but also all the tools, boats, carts or cattle used in the commission of that offence, they may be seized by the forest officer or the police officer. Every officer seizing any property under this section shall place on such property a mark indicating that the same has been so seized and shall as soon as may be make a report of such seizure to the magistrate having jurisdiction to try the offence on account which the seizure has been made. Provided that when the forest produce with respect to which such offence is believed to have been committed is the property of government and the offender is unknown. It shall be sufficient if the officer makes as soon as may be a report of the circumstances to his official superior. So, if it is already a government property, then it does not have to be confiscated. And if the offender is unknown, so in that case, it is sufficient if the officer just makes a report to the official superior. Power to release property seized under section 52. Any forest officer of a rank not inferior to that of a ranger, who or whose subordinate has seized any tools, boats, carts or cattle under section 52, may release the same on execution by the owner thereof, a bond for the production of the property so seized, if and when so required, before the magistrate having jurisdiction to try the offence on account of which the seizure has been made. So, in this case, the forest officer not below the rank of a ranger can release the property to that person and this release will be done on a bond and this bond would say that the owner will bring these properties to the court as and when he is required to do so. So, the forest officer is not required to keep everything with him, he can release these property on a bond to the owner. Then section 54 talks about procedure thereupon. What will the magistrate do? Upon the receipt of any such report, the magistrate shall, with all convenient dispatch, take such measures as may be necessary for the arrest and trial of the offender and the disposal of the property according to law. That is, when the magistrate has been informed that such and such seizure has been made because of such and such offence, then two things have to be done. One is the magistrate will have to deal with the person, the offender and the magistrate will have to deal with the property. And so, the magistrate will 
make measures or take measures as may be necessary for the arrest and trial of the offender. So it is possible that the person has not been arrested and in that case the magistrate will ask the police or the forest officials to arrest that person and make measures for the trial of the offender. Plus he will also make measures for the, disposable, for the disposal of the property according to law. Now forest produce, tall tools etc when liable to confiscation. All timber or forest produce which is not the property of government and in respect of which a forest offence has been committed and all tools, boats, carts and cattle used in committing any forest offence shall be liable to confiscation. So all of these timber and forest produce which is not the property of the government and all the tools, boats, carts and cattle used in committing of the forest offence they are liable to be confiscated. And such confiscation may be in addition to any other punishment prescribed for such offence. That is, if a person has committed an offence, then not only will the person be given an incarceration or a monetary penalty, but at the same time this confiscation is in addition to those penalties that will be given to the offender. Now, disposal on conclusion of trial for forest offence of produce in respect of which it was committed. When the trial of any forest offence is concluded, any forest produce in respect of which such offence has been committed shall, if it is the property of government or has been confiscated, be taken charge of by a forest officer and in any other case may be disposed of in such manner as the court may direct. So, the forest produce, if it is a property of the government or if it has been confiscated, it will be taken charge of by the forest officer. And if it is, it has not been confiscated, if it is not a property of the government, then it will be disposed of in such manner as the court may direct. Section 57 says, procedure when offender not known or cannot be found. When the offender is not known or cannot be found, the magistrate may, if he finds that an offence has been committed, order the property in respect of which the offence has been committed to be confiscated and taken charge of by the forest officer or to be made over to the person whom the magistrate deems to be entitled to the same. So, if the offender is unknown, or the offender cannot be found. In both of these situations, the magistrate, if he, he is convinced that the offence has been committed, so a forest offence has been committed here, he may order the property in respect of which the offence has been commi committed to be confiscated. If it is confiscated and it is made government property, then it will be taken charge of by the forest officer. Or he may also direct that if it is not being confiscated, it may be made over to the person whom the magistrate deems to be entitled to the same. So, for example, if there is a vehicle that was used and the owner of the vehicle is someone else, the owner of the vehicle has not committed the offence, the owner of the vehicle had, had taken all due diligence, all precautions, but even after that the vehicle was stolen and it was used in commission of the forest offence and the owner has already made a report to the police. So, in those cases, the magistrate may order that this uh, property should be made over to the person whom the magistrate deems to be entitled to the same, provided that no such order shall be made until the expiration of one month from the date of seizing of such property or without hearing the person, if any, claiming any right thereto and the evidence, if any, which he may produce in support of his claim. So, here we are observing that the principles of natural justice are in operation. So, there is a sufficient time. So, this uh, thing cannot be done until the expiration of one month from the date of seizing such property. So, there is an ample amount of time. And without hearing the person, if any, claiming any right dear to. So, if there is some person who says that, uh, that such and such uh, vehicle is mine, so 
the court will hear that person. He will be given a, an opportunity of hearing and the evidence, if any, that which he may produce in support of his claim. So, he can produce these evidences, he can uh, give a copy of the FIR that I had, uh, that this vehicle was stolen and I had already reported it. Procedure as to perishable property seized under section 52. So, in a large number of cases, the property is also perishable and this is especially true in the case of a large number of non-timber forest produce. So, if you talk about medicinal herbs, then especially they are extremely perishable. If you talk about fruits, they will not stand for a very long period of time. Similarly, if there are vehicles that are in such a condition that during the, uh, the process of the trial, they may completely get condemned. So, in those cases, this section is going to apply. So, if there is perishable property, then the magistrate may notwithstanding anything herein before contained, direct the sale of any property seized under section 52. So, that the magistrate may say that, okay, this property is perishable, so it must be sold and uh, subject to speedy and natural decay and may deal with the proceeds as he would have dealt with such property if it had not been sold. Meaning that in these cases, the magistrate may direct that, okay, this forest produce should be sold and this money should be deposited. And after this trial, whatever be the result, this money will be used in lieu of the forest produce. That is, if it is so determined that the forest produce belong to the government, then this money will be given to the government. And if it turns out that this forest produce actually bona fidely belong to uh, the person, then this money will be given to the person. This is what this section is saying. Then section 59, appeal from orders under section 55, 56 or 57. The officer made the seizure under section 52 or any of his official superiors or any person claiming to be interested in the property so seized may within one month from the date of any order passed under section 55, 56 or 57, appeal therefrom to the court to, will, to which the orders made by such magistrate are ordinarily appealable and the order passed on such appeal shall be final. So, basically for any of the orders under these sections, there is an appeal to the court. Property went to West End government. When an order for confiscation of any property has been passed under section 55 or 57, as the case may be and the period limited by section 59 for an appeal from such order has elapsed and no such appeal has been preferred. So, basically an order for confiscation was made and the time for putting in a, an appeal has already elapsed and nobody has preferred an appeal or when on such an appeal being preferred, the appellate court confirms such order in respect of the whole or a portion of such property. Such property or such portion thereof as the case may be shall vest in the government free of all encumbrances. So, what this section is saying is once the order of confiscation has been made, then the time for appeal kicks in. If that time has elapsed and nobody has preferred an appeal or somebody has preferred an appeal and the appellate court also says that this forest produce or this object should become a government property, it should be confiscated or the appellate court says that okay, not 100%, but say 80% of this uh, object should be uh, confiscated. So, that portion after the appeal, uh, after the appellate authority has given its decision, it will become government property and it will be free of all encumbrances meaning that there will not be any lien on this property. When the government gets this property, it does not get together with it any taxes that had to be paid or any other loans that had to be paid on that property. The government gets it free of all encumbrances that were so far attached to that property. Then section 61 talks about saving of power to release property seized. Nothing herein before contained shall be deemed 
to prevent any officer empowered in this behalf by the state government from directing at any time the immediate release of any property seized under section 52. Next, section 62 talks about punishment for wrongful seizure. Any forest officer or police officer who vexatiously and unnecessarily seizes any property on pretense of seizing property liable to confiscation under this act shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend to six months or which with a fine which may extend to 500 rupees or both. So basically this is a provision that protects the citizens that protects the general public from those forest officers or police officers who are unnecessarily seizing things on the pretense of seizing property liable to confiscation. So if somebody is misusing the act, then that person will be imprisoned for a period up to six months and may also be given a fine. Penalty for counterfeiting or defacing marks on trees and timber and for altering boundary marks. Now, we have seen before that the Indian Forest Act is basically a mercantile act. So, it is primarily telling that okay, this and this thing is government property and the government will put a mark and the government will treat it in such and such manner. Now, if somebody is defacing those mark, marks on trees, marks on timber, boundary pillars and so on, so what happens then? So, penalty for counterfacing or defacing marks on trees and timber and for altering the boundary marks. Whoever with intent to cause damage or injury to the public or to any person or to cause wrongful gain as defined in the IPC, knowingly counterfeits upon any timber or standing tree a mark used by forest officers to indicate that such timber or tree is the property of government or of some person or that it may lawfully be cut or removed by some person or alters, defaces or obliterates any such mark placed on a tree or on timber by under the authority of a forest officer or alters, moves, destroys or defaces any boundary mark of any forest or wasteland to which the provisions of this act are applied shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend to two years or fine or with both. So basically it stops, this section is there to stop people from putting marks on timber or standing tree, those marks that are used by the government officials. Or if there is a mark that is already put, it stops people from altering, defacing or obliterating those marks. And it also stops them from altering moving, destroying or defacing the boundary marks. So typically, we demarcate forest areas using boundary pillars and if somebody is moving those boundary pillars or if somebody is removing those boundary pillars, destroying those boundary pillars. So in all of these cases, this section kicks in and those persons shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend to two years or with fine or both. Now, section 64 is very important. It says power to arrest without warrant. Now, when we say power to arrest without warrant, we are talking about cognizable offenses. A cognizable offense is one where there can be an arrest without warrant. Now, this section is making everything cognizable. So, it says section 64, power to arrest without warrant. Any forest officer or police officer without orders from a magistrate and without a warrant arrest any person against whom a reasonable suspicion exists of his having been concerned in any forest offense punishable with imprisonment for one month or upwards. So all of those offenses have been made cognizable offenses. Every officer making an arrest under this section shall, without unnecessary delay and subject to the provisions of this act as to release on bond, take or send the person arrested before the magistrate having jurisdiction in the case or to the officer in charge of the nearest police station. Now we have seen that similar provisions are also there in the CRPC that if a person is arrested then he or she has to be taken before a magistrate. And nothing in this section shall be deemed to authorize such arrest for any act which is an offence under chapter 4 unless such act has been prohibited under clause C of section 30. 
basically what this section is saying is that these offenses which are punishable with imprisonment for one word for one month or upwards all of these are cognizable offenses and procedures have to be followed if an arrest is made next section 65 talks about power to release on a bond a person arrested now similar to the property persons can also be released on bonds any forest officer of a rank not inferior to that of a ranger who or whose subordinate has arrested any person under the provisions of section 64 may release such person on his executing a bond to appear if and when so required before the magistrate having jurisdiction in the case or before the officer in charge of the nearest police station. So who can release the person on a bond? Any forest officer. The police officer cannot release the person on a bond and this forest officer should be of a rank not inferior to that of a ranger. So a range officer and people who are superior to the rank of a ranger, they can do that. And who should be that ranger? It should be that ranger who or whose subordinate has arrested the person. So any other ranger cannot step in here. So this is the power to release on bond a person arrested. Then section 66 talks about power to prevent commission of an offence. Every forest officer and police officer shall prevent and may interfere for the purpose of preventing the commission of any forest offence. So basically the police officers or the forest officers do not actually have to wait for the offence to be committed and only then their role starts. That is not the case. They can also prevent the commission of offences. So even when the offence has not been committed, they can chip in under this section. Now section 67 talks about power to try offences summarily. The district magistrate or any magistrate of the first class, especially empowered in this behalf by the state government, may try summarily under the Code of Criminal Procedure 1898 any forest offence punishable with imprisonment for a term not exceeding 6 months or fine not exceeding 500 rupees or both. That is for those offences for which the punishment is less, not more than 6 months and fine is also less, not more than 500 rupees. For such offences, we can have summary trials and summary trials are now governed by chapter 21 of the CRPC. So these are the sections, power to try summarily. Summary trial by magistrate of the second class, procedure for summary trials, record in summary trials, judgment in cases tried summarily and language of record and judgment. So what is a summary trial? A summary trial is basically a shortened version of a trial. So it is quick, fast, cheap. And for those offenses where the punishment is less, they can be tried summarily is what this section is saying. Next, section 68 says power to compound offences. The state government may by notification in the official gazette empower a forest officer to accept from any person against whom a reasonable suspicion exists that he has committed any forest offence other than an offence specified in section 62 or section 63. Now, what are these sections 62 and 63? 62 is talking about punishment for wrongful seizure. So this offense cannot be compounded. And similarly, count, counterfeiting or defacing marks on trees and timber and altering boundary marks. These offenses cannot be compounded. But apart from these, the other offenses can be compounded. And what is compounding in this process? The forest officer is empowered to accept from any person against whom a reasonable suspicion exists that he has committed any forest offence other than the offence specified in section 62 or 63, a sum of money by way of compensation for the offence which such person is suspected to have committed. So basically in these cases the forest officer takes a compensation for the offence from the offender and then the offender is let go. When any property has been seized as liable to confiscation to release the same on payment of the value thereof as estimated by such officer. Meaning that if the forest officer has 
for instance uh, seized a vehicle so, suppose he has seized a motorcycle and the value of that motorcycle is 25000 rupees so in this case the forest officer will take this money in due of taking the motorcycle but in these cases as well there are limits but basically compounding means that you take the compensation and you take the value of the produce that was seized and is liable to to confiscation and then you close the case now on payment of such sum of money or such value or both as the case may be to such officer the suspected person if in custody shall be discharged the property if any seized shall be released and no further proceedings shall be taken against such person or property meaning that in these cases the suspected person if he is in custody he shall be discharged and the property that has been seized will be released and then no further proceedings shall lie so the case is basically closed a forest officer shall not be empowered under this section under he is a forest officer of a rank not inferior to that of a ranger so who can compound the offences ranger or above and is in receipt of a monthly salary amounting to at least 100 rupees and the sum of money accepted as compensation under clause a of subsection 1 shall in no case exceed the sum of 50 rupees so clause a of subsection 1 is talk, talking about these places so it is money for compensation of the offence not the value that has been estimated so essentially what happens these days under these provisions is that if something expensive has been seized then the value of that expensive thing is taken because otherwise this amount this compensation of 50 rupees it does not make much sense today now there are certain state governments that have enhanced it and in those cases these clauses are still very relevant but in other cases only they are only relevant for expensive things for which the value has to be paid now section 69 presumption that forest produce belongs to government when in any proceedings taken under this act or in consequence of anything done under this act a question arises as to whether any forest produce is the property of the government such produce shall be presumed to be the property of the government until the contrary is proved so who has to prove it the person who says that this is my property that person will have to prove it otherwise it will be presumed to be government property next chapter 10 deals with cattle trespass cattle trespass act 1871 to apply cattle trespassing in a reserved forest or any portion of a protected forest which has been lawfully closed to grazing shall be deemed to be cattle doing damages what do you mean by shall be deemed that there is no need to explicitly establish the damage so they will be deemed that they are doing damage to a public plantation within the meaning of section 2 of uh, the cattle trespass act 1871 and may be seized and impounded as such by forest officer or police officer so if cattle is trespassing then it can be seized and impounded then section 71 says power to alter fines fixed under the act the state government may by notification in the official gazette direct that in lieu of the fines fixed under section 1 of the cattle trespass act 1871 there shall be levied for each head of cattle impounded under section 70 of this act such fines as it thinks fit but not exceeding the following that is to say for each elephant 10 rupees each buffalo or camel 2 rupees for each horse mere gelding 1 rupee for each calf 8 annas so you can see here that these provisions have not been amended for quite a while so these days these provisions are not of much practical utility now chapter 11 deals with powers and indemnity of forest officers so section 72 says state government may invest forest officers with certain powers what powers power to enter upon any land and to survey demarcate and make a map of the same so the forest officer is empowered to enter any land and to survey demarcate and make a map the powers of a civil court to compel the attendance of witnesses and production of documents and material objects 
power to issue a search warrant under the CRPC and power to hold an inquiry into forest offences and in the course of such inquiry to receive and record evidence. And any evidence recorded under clause D of subsection 1 shall be admissible in subsequent trial before a magistrate provided that it has been taken in the presence of the accused person. Now here we find a distinction between police officers and forest officers. Now we have seen that in the case of Indian Evidence Act, if there is a confession that is made or a statement made in front of a police officer, it may not be proved in the court of law as against the person who made that statement. But that is not the case with the Indian Forest Act. So it says that any evidence recorded under clause D of subsection 1. What is clause D of subsection 1? It is power to hold an inquiry into forest offence and in the course of such inquiry to receive and record evidence. So any evidence that is received and recorded under this clause, it is admissible in subsequent trial before a magistrate provided that it has been taken in the presence of the accused person. So it is a valid evidence. Now in this context, the Honorable Kerala High Court in Forest Range Officer versus Abu Bakr has said that the admissibility of the confession made to the Forest Range Officer is not open to doubt since the embargo contained in Section 25 of the Evidence Act is not applicable to it. What is this embargo? Section 25 of the Indian Evidence Act says confession to police officer not to be proved. No confession made to a police officer shall be proved as against a person accused of any offence. But it clearly mentions confession to police officer. It does not say confession to any officer. It does not say confession to forest officer. And so the Honorable Kerala High Court is saying that the admissibility of the confession made to the forest range officer is not open to doubt since the embargo contained in section 25 of the Evidence Act is not applicable to it. Forest officers, though they are invested with some of the police powers, are not police officers. Hence, they can give evidence before court regarding admissions or confessions made to them by accused persons, whether or not such persons were then in custody. If the court considers such confession to be reliable, there is no legal bar in acting on such confession. So the statements made before the forest officer, they are admissible. Now section 73 says, forest officers are deemed to be public servants. All forest officers shall be deemed to be public servants within the meaning of the IBC 1860. So what do we mean uh, by saying that forest officers are deemed to be public servants? It means that if you look at section 21 of the IPC, it says it defines public servant. The words public servant denote a person falling under any of the descriptions here and after following. So it includes commissioned officer in the military, naval or air forces, judges including any person empowered by law to discharge whether by himself or as a member of any body of persons, any adjudicatory functions. Every officer of a court of justice, including liquidator, receiver or commissioner, whose duty it is, as such officer to investigate or report on any matter of law or fact, or to make, authenticate or keep any document. So this is regarding the courts of justice. Every juryman, assessor or member of a panchayat assisting a court of justice or public servant. Every arbitrator, every person who holds an office by virtue of which he is empowered to place or keep any person in confinement. Every officer of the government whose duty it is as such officer to prevent offences. Now we have seen before that the forest officers are empowered to prevent offences, to give information of offences, to bring offenders to justice or to protect the public health, safety or convenience. Every officer whose duty it is as such officer to take, receive, keep or expend any property on behalf of the government or to make any survey, assessment or contract on behalf of the government or to execute any revenue process or to investigate or to report on any matter affecting the pecuniary interests of the government 
or to make authenticate or keep any document relating to the pecuniary interests of the government or to prevent the infraction of any law for the protection of the pecuniary interests of the government and every officer whose duty it is as such officer to take receive keep or expend any property to make any survey or assessment or to levy any tax any rate or tax for any secular common purpose of any village town or district or to make authenticate or keep any document for ascertaining the rights of the people of any village town or district or any per person who holds any office by virtue of which he is empowered to prepare publish maintain or revise an electoral roll or to conduct an election or part of an election and every person in the service of pay of the government and remunerated by fee or commission for the performance of any public duty by the government or in the service or pay of a local authority corporation established by or under a central provincial or state act or a government company as defined in section 617 of the companies act so all of these people are defined to be public servants and why is it important to be defined as a public servant it is important because the ipc also defines offenses where people are res are resisting public servants not following their orders so those sections kick in now this section is saying that the forest officers are public servants within the meaning of this section of the ipc then section 74 talks about indemnity for acts done in good faith no suit shall lie against any public servant for anything done by him in good faith under this act so even if something wrong happens if it is it was being done in good faith then no suit shall lie against that public servant then section 75 talks about the trading by forest officers forest officers not to trade except with the permission in writing of the state government no forest officer shall as principal or agent trade in timber or other forest produce or be or become interested in any lease of any forest or in any contract for working any forest whether in or outside the territories to which this act extends so what is this section saying this section is saying that because the forest officers are interested with the responsibility of working of forest protecting the forest and dealing with timber so they should not be involved in any other personal trade in these matters because suppose a forest officer is himself a timber trader then it is quite possible that he might get trees cut from the forest and use them in his timber operations now to uh, to prohibit any such vested interest or conflict of interest this section section 75 is saying that forest officers are not to trade except with the permission in writing of the state government so only the state government can give permission to the forest officers to trade and this permission has to be in writing if they do not have this permission then they are not to trade whether as a principal or an agent so a principal or an agent means that whether as the primary trader or an agent of the trader whether as a boss or as a servant they are not going to be involved in this trade in timber or other forest produce or be or become interested in any lease of any forest or in any contract for working any forest so basically the forest officers cannot become contractors they cannot be involved in these contracting operations they cannot take lease of any forest area for its working whether in or outside the territories to which this act extends so basically this act extends to india but it says that forest officers are not to engage in these activities even outside these territories so you cannot have a forest officer who becomes a timber trader in nepal so that is prohibited by this section then 
chapter 12 deals with subsidiary rules additional powers to make rules section 76 the state government may make rules to prescribe and limit the powers and duties of any forest officer under this act so the state government can make a rule to prescribe the powers and duties that is the state government may say that a forest guard will have these powers and these duties a range officer will have these powers and these duties and it may also limit the powers and duties of any forest officer under this act this power is with the state government to regulate the rewards to be paid to officers and informers out of the proceeds of fines and confiscation under this act so the state government can also make rules to regulate the rewards to be paid to forest officers police officers and informers and where will the money come the money will come out of the proceeds of fines and confiscation that is done under this act for the preservation reproduction and disposal of trees and timber belonging to government but grown on lands belonging to or in occupation of private persons so the state government can make rules for the preservation reproduction and disposal of trees and timber belonging to government but growing on lands that belong to or are in occupation of private persons so basically a large number of states have declared certain trees species and certain timber articles as nationalized product which means that the government says that we are going to have uh, an interest in these products these are going to be government property even if it is growing in private lands so how are they to be disposed of for example in madhya pradesh if somebody is growing teak on his land then when these teak trees have come of age then they will be harvested and they will be sent to a timber depot that belongs to the government and from that timber depot these teak trees will be sold and the proceeds given back to the owner but it is prohibited that the owner will cut these trees and sell them out in the market because the government has nationalized this product teak so if this timber belongs to the government as in the case of teak but it is growing on lands belonging to or are in occupation of private persons such as farmers then the government can, the state government can make rules for the disposal of trees and timber and this is one such rule and generally to carry out the provisions of this act so it can also make other general rules then section 77 deals with penalties for breach of rules any person contravening any rule under this act for the contravention of which no special penalty is provided shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend to one month or fine which may extend to 500 rupees or both so what it is saying is in case of any contravention under this act for which no special penalty is provided so we have seen before that penalty of so many months so many years is provided under various sections but for those contraventions for which no penalty is provided then this section will be resorted to it says that for any of these an imprisonment up to one month fine up to 500 rupees or both may be awarded then section 78 talks about rules when to have force of law all rules made by the state government under this act shall be published in the official gazette and shall thereupon so far as they are consistent with this act have effect as if enacted therein so when the state government makes rules and publishes them in the official gazette so from that point onwards as as far as they are consistent this with this act they will have the same effect as if those rules were made inside this act is what this particular section is saying then chapter 13 deals with miscellaneous provisions section 79 says persons bound to assist forest officers and police officers so there is a duty that is given to persons that they have to assist forest officers and police officers every person who exercises any right 
in a reserved or protected forest or who is permitted to take any forest produce from or to cut and remove timber or to, to pasture cattle in such forest and every person who is employed by such person in such forest and every person in any village contiguous to such forest who is employed by the government or who receives emoluments from the government for services to be performed to the community shall be bound to furnish without unnecessary delay to the nearest forest officer or police officer any information he may possess respecting the commission of or intention to commit any forest offence and shall forthwith take steps whether so required by any uh, forest officer or police officer or not to do these things. That is to say, if there is any person who has been given any rights in the forest areas, whether to take forest produce, timber, pasture cattle or so on, or any person who is employed by these persons who have been given these privileges and every person in villages that are contiguous to the forest areas who are being employed by the government or are receiving emoluments for, from the government. All of those people are bound by this section to report any information about commission or intention to commit any forest offence to the nearest forest officer or the police officer and also to do these things that is to extinguish any forest fire in such forest of which he has knowledge or information. So if there is a forest fire all these people are bound to assist in extinguishing that forest fire to prevent by any lawful means in his power any fire in the vicinity of such forest of which he has knowledge or information from spreading to such forest and shall assist any forest officer or police officer demanding his aid. So if there is a, there is a fire in the vicinity of the forest then the person is also bound to stop this fire from entering into the forest areas. In preventing the commission of such forest, uh, in such forest of any forest offence. So, if there is any forest offence that is being uh, committed, then this person is bound to prevent its commission. When there is reason to believe that any such offence has been committed in such forest, in discovering and arresting the offender. So, he has to provide his services in discovering and arresting the offender who has done the forest offence. And any person who being bound to do so without lawful excuse, the burden of proving which shall lie upon such person, fails to furnish without unnecessary delay to the nearest forest officer or police officer any information required by subsection 1 or to take steps as required by subsection 1 to extinguish any forest fire in reserved forest or protected forest or to prevent as required by subsection 1 any fire in the vicinity of such forest from spreading to such forest or to assist any forest officer or police officer demanding his aid in preventing the commission in such forest of any forest offence or when there is reason to believe that any such offence has been committed in such forest in discovering and arresting the offender. So what happens is if the person who was bound to do all these things if he is not doing this and he does not have a lawful excuse and this lawful excuse has also to be proved by this person the burden of proving the lawful excuse lies upon that person now if he does not have a lawful excuse and if he did not do this then such person shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend to one month or with fine which may extend to 200 rupees or with both so this section is imparting a duty to the persons who are receiving certain emoluments or who are taking certain privileges in the forest areas. So it is imparting certain duties to them. And if they do not do those duties without a lawful excuse, it also prescribes a punishment for contravening that duty. Then section 80 talks about management of forests, which are the joint property of government and other persons. If the government and any person be jointly interested in any forest or wasteland, in the whole or any part of the produce thereof, the state government may either undertake the management of such forest, wasteland or produce 
accounting to such person for his interest in the same or issue such regulations for the management of the forest wasteland or produce by the person so jointly interested as it deems necessary for the management thereof and the interests of all parties therein so what it is saying is the state government if it is interested in any forest or wasteland together with a person so this forest belongs not just to the government but also with a person so the government can undertake the management of this forest wasteland or produce and it will give the person for his interest certain money that it uh, gets out of this management or the government may if if the if the government does not want to take the management of this forest it can also issue regulations for the management of the forest wasteland or produce by the person so jointly interested so it also has the power to issue regulations now when the state government undertakes under clause a of subsection 1 the management of any forest wasteland or produce it may by notification in the official gazette declare that any of the provisions contained in chapters 11 Uh, uh, chapters two and four shall apply to such forest, wasteland, or produce, and thereupon such provisions shall shall apply shall apply accordingly. Then section eighty one talks about failure to perform service for which a share in produce of government forest is employed. If any person be entitled to a share in the produce of any forest which is the property of the government, or over which the government has proprietary rights. or to any part of the forest produce of which the government is entitled upon the condition of duly performing any service connected with such forest such share shall be liable to confiscation in the event of the fact being established to the satisfaction of the state government that such service is no longer so performed meaning that if the government has given the privilege of sharing the produce of the forest to certain persons and for that they have to perform certain service and if that service is not being performed then the state government can confiscate the share of those people provided that no such share be confiscated until the person entitled thereto and the evidence if any which he may produce in proof of the due performance of such service have been heard by an officer duly appointed in that behalf by the state government so here you have the provision of audio alterum partum so before confiscating the share the person who had to perform that service and has not been performing that service in the view of the state government he will be given an opportunity to be heard and to provide evidence that he was actually performing the service that was required of him then section 82 talks about recovery of money due to government all money payable to the government under this act or under any rule made under this act or on account of the price of any forest produce or of expenses incurred in the execution of this act in respect of such produce may if not paid when due be recovered under the law for the time being in force as if it were an arrear of land revenue so if there is a money that is due to the government and if the money has not been paid then the money can be recovered from that person as if it were an arrear of land revenue is what this section is saying so even if you have not paid the dues it does not mean that the government cannot come after you it will be treated as an arrear of land revenue and the same provisions will apply to take this money from you now lien on forest produce for such money when any such money is payable for or in respect of any forest produce the amount thereof shall deemed to be a first charge on such produce and such produce may be taken possession of by a forest officer until such amount has been paid so if the money has not been paid on a forest produce then the produce may be taken into possession by the forest officer until this amount is paid and if such amount is not paid when due the forest officer may sell such produce by public auction and the proceeds of the sale shall be applied first in discharging such amount that is if money was due and the person is not paying it even after it was taken into possession by the forest officer then the forest officer may sell that forest produce through the means of auction and whatever money is 
received from the auction, the first share is that of the government. So, it will recover the money that was due. And the surplus, if any, if not claimed within two months from the date of sale of by the person entitled thereto, shall also be forfeited to the government. So, within two months, the person who had to pay this sum will have to make a, a claim that whatever is the surplus, it should be given to me. If it does not make that claim, then even that money will be forfeited to the government. Then section 84 talks about land required under this act to be deemed to be needed for a public purpose under the Land Acquisition Act 1894. Whenever it appears to the state government that any land is required for any purposes of this act, such land shall be deemed to be needed for a public purpose within the meaning of section 4 of the Land Acquisition Act. Then recovery of penalties due under bond. When any person in accordance with any provision of this act or in compliance with any rule made thereunder binds himself by any bond or instrument to perform any duty or act or covenants by any bond or instrument that he or that he and his servants and agents will abstain from any act, the whole sum mentioned in such bond or instrument as the amount to be paid in case of uh, a breach of the conditions thereof may notwithstanding anything in section 74 of the Indian Contract Act be recovered from him in case of such breach as if it were an arrear of land revenue. So, if there is a bond and if the bond is, uh, if, if the action is not being followed, then the penalty that was due in the bond, it will be recovered as if it were an arrear of land revenue. Then section 85A talks about saving for rights of central government. Nothing in this act shall authorize a government of any state to make any order or do anything in relation to any property not vested in that state or otherwise prejudice any rights of the central government or the government of any other state without the consent of the government concerned. Meaning that throughout this act we have been saying that the state government shall do this, the state government has that powers and so on. But that does not mean that the state government can encroach upon the rights of other states or that of the central government. So, th so this is what this section is referring to. Nothing in this act is authorizing a state government to make any order or to do anything in relation to any property that is not vested in that state or to otherwise prejudice any rights of the central government or the government of any other state without the consent of the government concerned. So, if a state government is trying to make an order or to do something that is impacting the rights of, certain, of some other state or that of the central government, there has to be first a consent of the central government. So, when we look at the Indian Forest Act, we find that most of its provisions are extremely mechanical in nature. They are only concerned about what will happen to what property, how will uh, the government's share be, uh, be preserved, how will the government's share be protected and what needs to be done for that protection. So, this act is not one that talks about ecological or, uh, or environmental security, it is only, it is mainly concerned about the pecuniary interests or the, pro or the proprietary interests of the government. So, that is all about the Indian Forest Act 1927. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.